Before I begin my sermon, I want to update you on some exciting news uh, for our church. As you may be aware, Southeast has owned 11 acres across the street from down at softball field entrance number five, and it's on Waterson Trail, and we've owned that property for over a dozen years. The parcel has been up for sale for nine years. It has been under contract three different times. Every single time, the uh, contract has fallen through for some reason. And last year, the elders began praying and evaluating what opportunities the Lord may have in mind for us to utilize that land, as we believe that there are a number of felt needs in the church family that are currently unmet. Uh, First, the use of our existing chapel here at the Blankenbaker campus for weddings has been decreasing each year. While the space served us well for the first 18 years, Our millennials are increasingly seeking more traditional wedding venues in older sanctuaries around town or even in outdoor venues. And we would love to see those couples choosing to start their journey here at the church that is their church. Secondly, due to the growing number of members, the use of the current chapel for funeral services has more than tripled in the last decade. Uh, This increased use results in numerous challenges from a scheduling perspective because, as you well know, you can't really schedule funerals weeks in advance, right? And so it poses some problems for us at, at times. Third, we believe that there are opportunities for additional worship service formats for young and old alike that can be utilized if a different space were available. Uh, The configuration of the Blankenbaker campus, the size of the building, makes it difficult for those who are less mobile to navigate the distance from the parking lots to the sanctuary. We have a number of members who now attend one of our multi-site venues, even though it's a farther drive for them, simply because the smaller venue is easier for them to get around. So in light of the needs and the fact that God has provided us with that land, Uh, the elders have prayerfully decided to construct a traditional-style chapel facility on the Watterson Trail site, and we plan to begin construction this fall. It will be called the Chapel in the Woods. It will... I'm glad you clapped. I just finished drawing that this morning. Uh... (laughs) The chapel in the woods will seat 750 people and will be able to be divided into smaller 400-seat sanctuary as needed. And the facility will be very traditional in design. It will have a wood floor, uh, stained glass windows, vaulted ceilings, uh, church pews. Uh, There will be classroom and fellowship meeting space, plus an outdoor wedding venue as well. And parking will surround the chapel so that most spaces are within a few hundred feet of the front door and on a level grade with the building. And it's our hope that with a small amount of money that we have set aside and with the continuance of your tithes and your generous offerings, uh, our hope is that we anticipate building that chapel and still remaining debt free. And uh, so we're excited about that. We see this as an additional ministry growth area as we continue to connect people to Jesus and one another. Uh, These are really exciting times at at Southeast. Uh, This year we are averaging 800 more each weekend than we did uh, last year, and God has continued to move. And I think sometimes we can get kind of uh, lulled to sleep by all the good that is taking place And I just would say to you, let's not take this for granted, and let's let's make certain that we are are thanking God for for what he's done. So let's begin with prayer, okay? Father, we we don't always want to have our hand out. We want to have our hand up, and we want to praise you and thank you. Uh, May we never take for granted uh, these facilities the sacrifices that those who have gone before us have made in order for us to be here. May we never uh, come to expect uh, crowded parking lots and, and all the blessings that we get to experience, but may we realize that they come from you and may we have a deeper fervor and more of a sense of urgency 
uh, to tell others about your son, Jesus. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Today, we conclude our series entitled Beneath the Surface, and we have been kind of stepping through the uh, book of James in the New Testament. So if you would, turn in your Bible to the the back of your Bible, and uh, you'll find the book of James right after the book of Hebrews, and turn to James chapter 3, and just kind of hold on to that, because we're going to walk through this passage today, and we're going to see how we can learn to control our mouths and control our speech Now, the average American has around 30 conversations a day. In any given year, you could fill up 66 books with 800 pages from just the words that you speak yourself. Every research project reveals the same thing, and that is that on an average day, a woman speaks 30,000 words, a man speaks 20,000 words. (laughs) Don't shoot the messenger, that's just the truth. That's what the research shows. I shared that in a sermon a few years ago, and a woman came up to me afterwards and said, 30,000, 20,000. I said, yes, ma'am. And and she said, well, I I believe that's true. And I kind of puffed up a little bit. And she said, because the way I figure it, all of us wives have to explain everything to our husbands two or three times (laughs) for them to understand it. Oh, okay, yeah. The conversation took an ugly turn at that point, all right? But our words are a reflection of what's inside. The tongue is a window to your heart. It can serve as an x-ray. It can serve as an ultrasound. It has the ability to, to let people know what is going on much deeper. And it's only when we focus beneath the surface that our tongues can truly be tamed for the glory of God. Now, when we say something that we later regret, sometimes our first response is to make excuses and say, well, you know what, that just wasn't me, or I'm not really sure where that came from. And in your mind, you think that was just an isolated event, but in truth, in your heart, that is who you are, that is who I am. Socrates said, speak, friend, that I might see thee. So what I want to do today is I want to give us three takeaways. And they're found right in this passage in James chapter three. And the first takeaway is this, recognize the power of the tongue. Look in your Bible at verse two of James three. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. So James lumps himself in with the reader and says, we all struggle in this area of the tongue. And it's written in the present tense. In other words, we all stumble habitually. We all struggle with this. The word stumble here means a moral or a spiritual failure. If we didn't have those type of mistakes, we would be perfect. And and someone has already taken that role. Thank God. James 3, look at verses 3 and 4. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. So the first thing that James says is that the tongue is powerful enough to to control a horse. Just as you put a bit in there to control where that horse goes, that's the way a tongue is with us. It controls where we go. Just like a rudder with a ship helps to steer it. It doesn't matter the size of the vessel. It's the same way with our tongue. And yet if it's reined in appropriately, that same power can be used to encourage rather than to destroy. Each week, the the church sends out a tweet each week talking about the upcoming message. And when someone saw that it was on taming the tongue, she facetiously tweeted back and said, a sermon that I do not want to hear. I consider my insults a work of art, and I take pride in my craft. You know? (laughs) And we can all relate to that. We joke that that God has blessed us with the gift of sarcasm. Or we have the ability to be able to put people down and put them in their place. But here's the truth. Every one of us struggles in at least one of these areas. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 talks about how we are to build one another up with the different words that we say. 
You, you hear me say how the God of the universe spoke the world into existence. And with that in mind, since God created the world with words, shouldn't we be more careful with the words that we use? And there are so many different ways that our words can harm others and, and even damage our own witness. Let me step through just a few of them. There's false flattery. Feel free to write these down if you want. False flattery, that's buttering someone up with impure motives. There's gossip. Gossip is sharing something that you may or, or may not know to be true, but all it can do is wound someone. There's no good that can come out of it. And once you say those words, gossip, you can't get them back. It's like trying to put toothpaste back into an empty tube. It's impossible. Proverbs 16, verse 28. A perverse person stirs up conflict, and the gossip separates close friends. So there's no benefit in gossiping, and repeating it does no good. Here's the difference between false flattery and gossip. Flattery is saying something to someone's face that you would never say behind their back. Gossip is saying something behind their back that you would never say to their face. Another negative way is cutting someone down or putting them down. And so everything that comes out of your mouth is a put down. You're constantly trying to belittle others, but you never make yourself look bigger by trying to make others look smaller. And people who constantly do that, they give themselves away because the person in your workplace who is always like that, they are revealing that they have a terrible self-image and they're telling you something about themselves. Another negative way we can stumble in our speech is through lying. You say, oh, come on, Dave. I mean, everybody stretches the truth. I mean, a little fib or a white lie. I mean, don't exaggerate this. This is nothing to get worked up over. But this sermon isn't about your opinions or about my opinions. It's, it's about looking at the standard that we find in God's word. And God has some very strong words when it comes to lying. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars... They will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. So the Bible says that hell is reserved for those who lie. Do you think that God feels strongly about telling the truth? The Lord lumps liars in the same category as murderers, the sexually immoral, and sorcerers. Wow, if you struggle with telling the truth and that verse doesn't get your attention, then I would suggest that your conscience has become seared. And your heart has been hardened. Another way of, of negative talk is, is crude joking. I have to be careful on this. I might think something's funny a, and I go across that line. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking. And it goes on to say that no impure person has any inheritance in the kingdom of God. Aren't you glad you came today? <laughs> well, the next area is that of cussing. The hits just keep on coming, all right? Colossians chapter 3, verse 8, talks about how we must rid ourselves of filthy language from our lips when, when I finished high school, I worked for three months um, as a laborer, and I was with a pretty rough group, and it seemed that everything that came out of their mouth was foul, and when they learned that I was going to be a preacher, that didn't slow them down. It was like throwing gasoline on the fire, and although they didn't pull me into that, in all honesty, I must say that by the end of the summer, when something would happen there would be words that popped into my mind that I'd never thought of before in those situations. Fortunately, it had not become second nature for me to say it as it had for them. But I know that many of you, it's not for three months. You've been in a job like that for three years or for 30 years. And you're constantly surrounded by, by that type of language and the filth 
And we live in a society where our mouths spout off with no regard to others. And this isn't just men. This is ladies. These are teens. Maybe it's road rage. Maybe it's cussing out an umpire or an employee. Perhaps it's verbally exploding with your spouse. Maybe, maybe it's you've watched so many reality TV shows and it's become second nature to you. You hear all the language that now you just say it in everyday conversation. But let me tell you something. When you control your speech, this is a great way to stand out and be distinctive from the rest of the world. I've saved perhaps the most important warning for the last one, and that is taking the Lord's name in vain. And you are familiar with the Ten Commandments. Listen to one of them in Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. It says, You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. That's a frightening scripture. Did you ever notice that two of the Ten Commandments... Two of the Ten Commandments deal with the tongue. Uh, Shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain, and you shouldn't bear false witness. In other words, you should not tell a lie. That phrase, taking the Lord's name in vain, means that we don't treat God's name flippantly or casually or cavalierly or irreverently. Psalm chapter 8, verse 9 reminds us, O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You know, the Jewish people, had an unusual reverence for the holy name of God. It was so unique that they they would not even utter the name for fear of committing blasphemy. They had such an incredible sense of reverence that they, they wouldn't even say it. Oh, how far we've fallen. And the intent of the command is that we don't reduce God's name down to where it's meaningless and insignificant in our lives. And yet at times through our words, we have torn down our, our, the deity of Christ, our reverence for God through our careless treatment of his name. And yet we hear it constantly from people and gradually it chips away and, and soon it doesn't even phase us. And if we're not careful, our own vocabulary begins to include of some of what we hear. And for some of you, you hear God's name trashed so frequently. And it's become so accepted that you will carelessly say, oh my God. The one name in all the Bible that God tells you not to. It doesn't even register in our minds. You don't even give it a second thought. And the more we hear people demean God's name, in time we begin to say it, and soon the Christian community no longer cringes. Instead, we just kind of join in, and we don't even realize it. And so I want to encourage you to take some steps and to grow in these areas, to treat the name of God and Jesus Christ with the holy respect. I, I understand it won't be easy. For some of you, that's, that's all you've heard in your home. And I know you, it might not change overnight, but ask someone to help you with this. Find a Christian friend to hold you accountable. Say, will you help me on this? If you hear me saying something that is too casual about God, will you, will you say something to me? I want to break that habit. Because if you don't do something to make a change, it will damage your witness, and more importantly, it will wound the one that you claim is the Lord and Savior of your life. Matthew 12, verse 36 says, Moreover, I tell you this, On the day of judgment, people will have to give account for every careless word they have spoken. That is Jesus Christ speaking. By your words, you'll be justified. By your words, you'll be condemned. So if you want to change the direction of your life, it begins by changing the words that you speak. Look back in your text at James 3. Look at verses 5 and 6. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. The tongue has the power of life and death in in your workplace, in your marriage relationship, in your friendships, and even in the church. The things that you say can be powerful. They can be for good or they can be for bad. 
Luke chapter 6, verse 45. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil out of the things evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. What a verse. (laughs) Whatever's inside comes out. In the same way, that can be negative. In the same way, that can be positive. So don't think that, oh, I've got all these don'ts and I'm not supposed to do this, I'm not supposed to talk like that. No, flip the script, as Kyle said. Instead, concentrate on what can you be saying positively? The things that come out of your mouth, do they encourage, do they build others up? I'm reminded of uh, Bob Russell's brother, John. Uh, He and his wife, John and, and Susan, were on vacation. They were out of town one day, and they went to a church service. Uh, they'd never been to this church before. It was an evening. The worship leader was up there uh, leading some songs. And, and about halfway through, the worship leader just stopped. He said, hey, he said, you know what? He said, for our greeting time tonight, we're going to do something a little different. He said, rather than just saying, hi, how are you to the people around you and shaking their hand, I want you to take the hand of the person that's right behind you, and I want you to look them in the eyes, and I want you to say, I love you. And John Russell thought, oh, I can't believe this. This is the hokiest thing I've ever heard in all my life. And then he thought, I can't believe this guy is going to manipulate us to do this. But compliantly, like a sheep, he just kind of turned around, he stuck his hand out, and when he did, looking into his eyes was the most beautiful young woman he'd ever seen in his life. (laughs) And she took his hand and she looked back and said to him, I love you. And before John could say anything, John's wife leaned over and said, we love you too. So there are positive things that can be, be said. There are ways that you can put a smile on someone's face. There's ways that you can encourage others. But make certain that your words are positive because your words are powerful. Here's the next takeaway. Take Realize how dangerous our words can be. Realize how dangerous our words can be. Look in your Bible at verses 7 and 8. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Did you catch that last phrase? It is a restless evil. And the word restless here means ready to break out at any time. That's a good description of my mouth. A tongue is ready to break out at any time. Uh, I, I think about a time recently when I felt compelled to call up a church member and just apologize because my words had been rather short. Our words break out. That restless evil erupts out of our mouth and those words hurt people. And then you wonder, where did that come from? I'll tell you where it came from. It came from your heart. It came from my heart. It's a reflection of our heart. And if the power of the tongue is not kept in tight rein by walking in the Spirit and relying on the Spirit and asking God to do a work with our language, then it's going to be a tough thing to tame. I mean, James says that in his many words, but that doesn't mean that we don't necessarily try to tame it. If this is an area of struggle for you, then ask the Lord Invite him into the process to help you grow in self-control. It was Calvin Coolidge who said, I have never been hurt by anything that I didn't say. Here's the third takeaway. Use your words for God and for good. I want you to look at verses 9 through 12. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So he says we can't use our mouths both for praising God and for slandering others. It's counterproductive. It's it's counterintuitive to the Christian life to use the same tongue to encourage others and and use that same tongue to rip other people up. So we have to decide that that we're going to allow God to have control over our tongue. 
And we're going to have to say, Lord, you, you've got to make the difference. And then we have to get creative and wise and on the lookout for how we can make certain that our speech brings people to Christ. How our words uplift and edify others. How the only thing that comes out of our mouth is the truth. James talks about that a little bit later in this letter. He, he, he says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. You, you shouldn't have to say, I swear, I swear. If a person says, I swear all the time, it makes you wonder the other times if they were telling the truth. You shouldn't have to go to that trouble. But use your words for God and for good and dig beneath the surface. Many of you all know the, the name Lee Strobel. Uh, Lee Strobel spoke here seven or eight years ago on a weekend. In our generation, he's one of the greatest apologists. He has sold over 15 million books, most of which were written to help substantiate a person's faith. Now, what you may not know is that Lee Strobel used to be a staunch atheist. In fact, his wife came to Christ, and he was so mad that she became a Christian that he thought, I'm going to do a deep, detailed study, and I am going to rip Christianity to shreds. But he began studying and examining the evidence, and everything changed. And he realized that, that this is God's word. And the manuscript evidence was overwhelming to him. He did all sorts of studies. And he gave his life to Jesus Christ. But before he became a Christian, there was a dark side to Lee Strobel. He writes, My daughter Allison was five years old when I became a follower of Jesus. And all she had known in her five years was a dad who was profane and angry. He said, I remember I came home one night I kicked a hole in the living room wall just out of anger for life. I am ashamed to think of the times that Allison hid in her room to get away from me. But several months after I gave my life to Jesus Christ, that little girl went to my wife and said, Mommy, I want God to do for me what he's done for Daddy. At age five, what was she saying? She'd never studied the archaeological evidence regarding the truth of the scriptures. All she knew was her dad used to talk and act this way, but more and more her dad is now talking and acting another way. And if that is what God does to people, then sign her up. And that was her spirit. You see, the best evidence of the power of Christ is a changed life. You see, the root of the problem isn't here. It's here. It's not your tongue, it's your heart. That's the starting point to change, to invite and allow God to do a work in our hearts so that we can use our words for God and for good. How intentional are you at opening your mouth and telling others of the one who has saved you? How often do you use your tongue to tell others about Jesus? You see, people can't accept the message unless the word of God has been communicated to them. And that's where you come in. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Now, we all have some things about our health that we wish we could change. Maybe it's a disability. Maybe it's some challenge. Maybe it's just something that we, we just wish we could change. And perhaps we'll struggle with it until someday we're in heaven and we have a glorified body. You know, in recent years, doctors have made incredible progress when there has been an individual who was unable to hear or who has had a loss of hearing. And I want you to watch a video that is a compilation of the instant, the very first moment when a person who couldn't hear was enabled to hear for the first time. Watch this with me. Recording, Lachlan. First, his hearing. first hearing aid. Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> okay. This is the, the big this moment is the here. Moment. She's gonna hear something. We don't really know what. I'm gonna hold this on. I'm gonna push on your head just a little bit. There you go. It's creepy. So now technically your device is on. <laughs> Can you tell? You said you hear it. 
<laughs> hey, I sound. You're hearing yourself better. <laughs> okay, you can cry. That's okay. Hi, Cooper. <gasps> Hi, Cooper. <laughs> Hi, baby. Sounds good. I know I look like an elderly munchkin, but do I sound like one now? Blue. Blue. Orange. Orange. Red. Red. Black. Black. Oh, purple. Purple. <laughs> What do you think? <laughs> what is it like? Yeah. <laughs> so different to you. Yeah. <laughs> sound clear or does it sound muffled? It sounds clear. When I first saw that video, uh, when I first saw that video, as I watched their responses, there was something about those reactions uh, that were quite familiar to me. And yet I've never been in a doctor's office when a, when a person's hearing device is tested for the first time. And yet somehow I felt like I had seen it before. And then I realized that I witnessed responses like that on almost a weekly basis. When someone comes forward, when someone talks to a decision guide in the back, when someone stands in that baptistry and says, I believe that Jesus is a Christ, the Son of the living God, my Lord and Savior. And in those moments when they speak, they may initially try to remain unaffected or at least indifferent to what they are hearing themselves say. But as the words break through, so does their emotion. And sometimes all somebody needs in order for their life to change forever is to hear the good news for the very first time. And maybe you're the one who gets to do the speaking. So make certain that the words that you say are for God and for good. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, you've given many of us the ability to be able to talk, to be able to hear. We know the hearing comes from the word of God. And we know that we have the opportunity. May we not be silent. Give us boldness, give us courage, but more importantly than even that, will you give us love so that people can hear our message from a heart like Christ's. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. There's a verse in Matthew chapter 10 where Jesus says, if you confess me before others, I will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. The next verse goes on to say, but if you don't confess me, if you neglect me, if you reject me, if you disown me, then that's the same thing that Christ will do with us someday. So you have an opportunity to speak up for Christ today. If you've never turned your life over to him and confessed his name, you can do so. If you want to be a part of this church family, this could be your moment. You can meet me right down front uh, as we stand together and as we worship.